Hey, so there's a lot going on right now. We get it. We hear you. Change is hard. It always is. And we know how much you care about this show. And we know how much it means to you. It means the same to us. It means everything to us. So we have no intention of stopping this anytime soon. The show will continue at the same level that you've come to expect from us week after week, year after year, and with your continued support decade after decade. So thank you. Seriously. Here's the show. There's no place to escape to. This is the last talk. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. What was that? Oh, you ready? We doing this? We're recording? Uh, Whoa, we're recording. Wow. Uh, Man. <laughs> Uh, Is that how you started it? Uh, uh, no, man, I got, um, I'm rocking them beta blockers. Oh, ooh, rocking man. them. You, you ever done that? How you rock a beta blocker? Just eat them. Yeah, just eat them. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of fun because I feel like, like I'm in my own cockpit. Like I'm a little pilot. Yeah. You know, it's going like, here we come. And our cruising altitude, 33,000 feet. Don't look at those nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you're not asleep, the nightmares keep coming to your eyes. But we're just going to cruise on over that. You take your little left to see Grand Canyon. Don't jump. You're going to want to just keep on saying, oh, we can put the seatbelts on. And it's like, yeah, I'm just in my head, just constantly just like not dive bombing. Hell yeah, man. Put your seatbelts on. It's time for last podcast on the left, whoa, everybody. Whoa, whoa, yeah. yeah. Don't go to the Nightmare Canyon. Stay away. My name is Marcus Parks. I'm here with Henry Zabrowski. Where you've been. And happy birthday, Ed Larson. Yeah. It's my birthday. 42 yes. 40, feeling blue. 40 poo, man. 40 poo. I had a big one today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was nice. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you just, earned it. Yeah, yeah. You just showed me a picture of uh, your dog that, you know, your mom had dressed up with like a birthday cap for your birthday. Was that for your birthday? No, that or was for the for dog. Her, it was the dog's birthday. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah, dog yeah. knows. <laughs> they know exactly what's happening. <laughs> Guys, I'm, I'm legit excited about this topic. Yeah. It yeah. has been a while since we've covered like a true, like, solid American villain. Yeah. yeah. You know, and this is, you know, it don't get much frostier than this. It really doesn't. We're finally getting to one of the most well-known spree killers in American history, Andrew Cunanan. Why did it take so long? Uh, for us to cover him? Yeah. There was a huge mini series yeah. and he looked really sexy and then you kind of you, you want to give it some space. We probably should have done it when the new mini series came out, but we're not good at marketing. Yeah. yeah. I actually argued when the series was coming out. I was like, no, 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 we can't do the series because like there's a mini series out right now. And I didn't realize that's that, like, like why they that that's people why do you that. do it, because people would be curious and would, you know, g- g- Google and such. But I'm bad at it. Well, you know, what are you going to do? No, nothing. You yeah. just wait three I years. I started watching the series because of this. See, so there's that. We're so helping. helping them oh, out. That's wonderful. Let's yeah. give ex- let's I'm give still FX under strike. Moose. I'm still under goddamn strike. <laughs> well, Andrew Kunanen was a spree killer. Oh, Mr. Kunani. <laughs> Do you not call him Mr. Kunani, Kunani in your head? Mr. Yeah. Kunani? Who's Mr. Kunani? Andrew Kunanen. Oh, you call him Mr. Kunani. Yeah, that's in my head all the time. <laughs> oh, Mr. Kunani. Don't, and- hurt, don't hurt him. What's that? What are you talking about? Mr. Kunanen to hurt him. <laughs> Andrew Kunanen was a spree killer who murdered five people over the course of three months during the summer of 1997. <sighs> Up until the modern rash of spree killers in this century, Kunanen was probably the most famous, not least because he ended his spree with the murder of fashion icon Gianni Versace. See, I've already changed the shape of the word Kunanen in your head. Because you've been calling him Kunanan this whole time, because I called him Mr. Kunan. I didn't know his name was actually Kunanan. I actually don't know. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> says it different. One of the worst is when I was watching like the footage of like the new, you know, like the the original Manhunt. And they also called him like Kunanan. Yeah, I've heard Kunanan. Well, That's it's terrible. Just, it's it's obviously the worst one. Series of letters. Yeah, <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah, it's it's a spree murdering version of a banana. <laughs> <laughs> but true to his transformation from spree killer to assassin, Kunanen was a shapeshifter, an empty vessel for whatever story might make him seem more impressive to peers and strangers. Specifically, though, Andrew's greatest survival mechanism was his ability to transform into the perfect kept boy for wealthy old gay men. Man, where's that genie's lamp? 
<laughs> I can fucking take a look at it. Uh, he's sort of like if Bugs Bunny, like he's a Bugs Bunny type character. He's a shapeshifter. He appears to you as he wants to yeah, be. He can be Elmer, a sexy lady. If Elmer Fudd was rich. Yes. <laughs> and he was right there. And then if Bugs Bunny like died, he bleached his hair to gay murderer white. Like, you know how that happens? I've seen that happen a lot of times. People, I've heard that's a good joke when you like know like a friend of yours who goes bleach blonde. He's about to kill his fucking family. <laughs> that is it, Robin Williams in one hour photo. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but when it came to the casual lies, Kunanan might say he owned a construction company, despite being in his early 20s. Other times, he'd say he was an aspiring actor named Christopher. Mm. Well, oh. he probably was. He might have been. No, yeah, he was an actor. He was an actor in life. Okay. Never landed a role, though. Mm. Well, we will talk about That's his what I'm saying. career later. Yeah. All right. Quote unquote actor. Okay. Sometimes he'd be a naval officer, or he'd claim that his father was a ranking member of the Israeli Mossad. And don't repeat that. <laughs> okay. I know it's a fun secret for you for me, Andrew Kunanan. All right. But in reality, Andrew Kunanan was one part grifter and three parts parasite, whose fragile world of lies eventually crumbled into a rage that resulted in five murders. Now, it's arguable what made Kunanan snap. <laughs> it is. Because it it really, I feel like he snapped when he was born. <laughs> <laughs> like, he was not good necessarily from the top. Well, what it seemed innocuous at first, and well, then slowly turned into it in the MO of a shape-shifting serial killer. Well, I'd say at no point would anyone describe Andrew Kunanan as chill. Yeah. No. 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 Or fun, I don't think. Well, no, you see, he was quite, it was like, a, he was fun in a way that you were like, Cocaine. Oh. He did cocaine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then like, <laughs> like a fire at a toy factory. The sounds are fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one might say that the dam broke when it became clear that the high society lifestyle he always wanted would forever be out of reach. It could also be said that Kunanan had a pathological need to not only be liked, but adored and admired. And specifically for doing nothing. Yes. When that need was not satisfied in relation to a specific man who had no sexual interest in Kunanen, it might have simply become too much for his fragile ego, and it was all downhill from there. But most likely, Kunanen's anger was always going to be unleashed on the world in one way or another. As we'll get into at the end of this episode, Andrew eventually found something that gave him a justification for letting his homicidal urges run free. And it certainly didn't help that he was doing a lot of meth at that time. Ah, meth. It, not okay. it, it prepped you. It <laughs> yeah. preps you for that. You know, like it gets you ready. It gets you in the head space to murder a bunch of people. Yeah. It was also a common phrase that he'd use all the time. If you listen to one of the books, like, you know, we'll get into the sources that are just as dubious as the man himself. But he said... Uh, constantly, he's like, you know, if if I get his main lament, if I get HIV, I'm going on a five state killing spree. Yeah, and he'd say that a lot, all the time. It didn't you know? He didn't uh, fulfill that promise. It was a four state killing spree. See yeah. again, oh, okay. you know, that's what's hard. What a he, loser. He, he, <laughs> God, does anyone do a little bit of meth? <laughs> <laughs> I have heard of people like I, like I've definitely dabbling. Like one of those things where it's like, yeah, I tried meth once. It was I, really good. I know and some people that tried it once, and then they said that apparently it's like the five days of fucking is like a lot. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, but regardless of the reasons behind Kunanan's four state killing spree, mm, pussy. The, <laughs> <laughs> the fact remains that he was a hollow person with hollow ambitions whose inhumanity resulted in the deaths of four everyday people and one of the most foremost fashion icons of the 20th century. Now, as far as sources go today, there's surprisingly never been a serious book written about the Andrew Kunan and murder spree. Instead, we got two old-fashioned true crime paperbacks that are heavy on the homophobia, but reliable with certain facts. They are very... Salacious. Yes. I would not call them unserious necessarily, but they are they are thick. Like vulgar favors is thick. Sure. But it is uh there's a lot of spin and there's a lot of character building within it. Because what really hard is that like if somebody who's a human labyrinth of a prism of different personalities who appears as different people 
to others. They, everybody's got a different read on him. Some people know him as a fucking flake, a criminal, a thief, a drug addict. There's other people that know him as like my best friend, the godfather to my children. And so they, this, that, especially that book, they try to kind of like condense a bunch of different views of him in one. And it's it's hard because um, there was no Andrew Cunanan. Yeah, there really wasn't. What was the phrase that you used when we talked about it? Is that, that constantly talking about the slippery gay? Well, that vulgar <laughs> favors is just the entire book is just about how like 99% of gay men I have met are unbelievably boring. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, so this they, again and again. They do nothing. Right, they're remotely interesting. Yeah, yeah because all. they're just people. Yeah, there's people. They don't have a woman telling them what to do. <laughs> nice, <laughs> Nick. Wow, wow. wow. Finally, oh, yeah. um, I'll take out the trash whenever I feel like it. <laughs> Great, good idea, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> you know what, Gary? It's fucking awesome. Let's suck each other's dicks. No, that I don't think. I think it's more nuanced, Eddie. <laughs> it's nuanced. But not every single gay man is in a sordid world of S and M sex, casual drug use, and coming in flower pots like <laughs> yeah. these guys are all like it's it, these guys have a different idea of even where these yeah. like the quote unquote down and dirty areas of gay culture what they're like because I think a lot of times even those are kind of boring yeah it's lots of staining furniture and stuff like that yeah we worked at a, in a very intense gay bar in Florida in Tallahassee yes. and when we were there like you know yeah there was sometimes blood everywhere yeah. but a lot of times that it was consensual yeah, yeah. yeah they wanted it and that was also just Tallahassee yeah it's not necessarily a gay bar there's a lot of bars in Tallahassee Tallahassee with blood everywhere. Oh, yeah. oh my God, yes. But these books, when I say they're not necessarily <laughs> serious, I mean, they're full of wild speculation. Yes. Unsourced claims. Contradictory views. I mean, the latter criticism, of course, is what Henry just said. It's Andrew Cunanan's inherent nature as a pathological liar. So there's yeah. bound to be you know, there's bound to be contradictory views. And many people that want to get involved in the story no matter what, because mm -hmm. it uh, because of what he did in a sort of socially networking kind of way, adding Gianni Versace to his own murders, which added him to the Gianni Versace Wikipedia page that added everybody else who wants to talk about Andrew Cannanan to the same exact morbid trail of attention. Yes. But at any rate, the first source is Death at Every Stop. By Winsley Clarkson. Very grisly book. Very. Yeah. While the second... Uh, riding a bus in Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> While the second, which was used as the basis for the FX Andrew Cunanan show a few years ago, is Vulgar Favors mm. by Maureen Orth. Mm, Mr. Cunanan. I guess that's what it says here at the very top, the prologue. You have to remember, I love these books. I love true crime books. Is Mr. Cunanan, is that a Michael Jackson thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. No. I think it, Mr. Poon. Kunani, that sounds fun, but you know, Mr. Kunani, I don't know. I don't Mr. Kunani, I want him nowhere near my family. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is from Richard Strauss's opera, Capriccio. <laughs> Which we will be discussing. Just look delicious. At, look at the vulgar favors that give the crowds at the capital such delight. Its amusements are insolent, obscene, clumsy, boorish. You despise these lewd doings, and yet you suffer them. The book begins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like lewd doings. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that. I love lewd doings. Lewd doings is almost better than vulgar favors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lewd doings is my burlesque name. <laughs> and there's also a fictionalized version of the story that our head researcher Joel read out of curiosity <laughs> called Three Month Fever by a guy seriously named. Gary, Indiana. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not That's a fake amazing. name. <laughs> well, you know he's a piece of shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a rat bit my sister. Hi. I'm Gary, I'm Indiana. I'm Gary, Indiana. <laughs> and I wouldn't take her to the goddamn hospital because I'm sick of that bitch. <laughs> I didn't read it myself, but it's apparently gonzo as fuck. Joel said it's great. He had a great time reading it. Mm -hmm. He said it uses phrases like, Get the thrill of creaming. And... Got sucked deeper by the goop in the vagina. Oh, Jesus. You know what? It, it does sound like a gay man's version of sex with a woman. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But without further ado, let's get into the story of Andrew Kunan. Yeah. The murder of Gianni Versace. And why you'd get at me? And the four murders that occurred along the way. Oh, Mr. Kunani, we're coming for your fucking dead ass. <laughs> 
<laughs> so Andrew Cunanan was born August 31st, 1969 in San Diego, mm. which is where we'll be hosting the LPN Beach Blanket Bingo Show on October 20th at the Balboa Theater. Tickets on sale now. That's a well really done. good That's plug. really well done. Thank, yeah. Thank you so you. much. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Get them now. They're going fast. <laughs> <laughs> Kunanan's father was from the Philippines. He was some guy named Modesto who sometimes went by the more Americanized name of Molesto. Pete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pete, because he wanted to sound less ethnic. Yeah. He was a former naval officer who eventually switched careers to become a stockbroker. But as we'll find out later, Modesto was just as much of a fraud as his son was. Hey, he at least had a fake job. He did have it. Well, he, he had a real job that he was he turned fake, that fake. He was fake good at. Yeah, 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 he turned it fake. He I don't know how to describe. He looks like an evil concierge. <laughs> Have you seen Modesto? What he looked like? No. With the paper thin little mustache, kind of a big bulbous head, dressed to the nines in designer clothes. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of rings, a lot of jewelry. Yeah. That's how I want to dress. And me too. Honestly, <laughs> I want to look like Leisure Suit Larry without all the <laughs> other stuff attached to it. Man, I love that kid. Yeah. Well, as far as Kunanan's mother went, she was a quiet, put upon, devout Catholic named Marianne who met Modesto in a bar. She said it was like meeting the Filipino Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> well, what other people described him was the Filipino Errol Flynn. Oh, um, yeah. He was yeah. dressed in a white tuxedo, Ooh. had a pencil thin mustache, Ugh. broad, strong. <laughs> But he was like five foot four. Yes, he was very small. But I like that, though, because, again, you can be strong, yet small. That's the whole point. You look like a torpedo. <laughs> you think he got in as many fights as Errol Flynn? You know what? Maybe more. Maybe Probably. he was contractually allowed to win those fights. I don't know if, if you actually went up to Errol Flynn and, like, popped him in the mouth. I don't know what he'd do. Well, he was known for fighting people in public. Whoa, is that real? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's awesome. Errol Flynn was a fucking lunatic. I miss old air actors. <laughs> <laughs> old actors were actually, like, like, did things in their lives. Yeah. Now, like his son, Modesto was highly charismatic. He and Marianne were married within a year, and six months later, she was pregnant with the first of four children. The last child was Andrew Cunanan. Reportedly, and I'm going to use that word a, a lot. Very good. Because mm-hmm. so much of Cunanan's story is taken from stories other people told. Yeah. Just remember this, too. Everything we cover, because both of these books are shockingly different. Yeah. And what they cover within his personal life. And the other stuff I was looking at, like, because this book, The uh, the Vulgar Favors, which they changed into the miniseries version of it. Like, this was written for Vanity Fair, yeah. which was a partially... Uh, try to get we'll get a little bit into it but they were trying to get Andrew's con- like attention during the manhunt by putting articles out in his so-called favorite magazine they, they knew that he'd read they thought that he she would get in contact with this woman this woman was trying to get in contact with Andrew Keenan for the entire time wow. when they were tracking his crimes yeah but uh you know, remember Andrew's crimes happened over like three months yeah so these are very like it's it's very interesting to see just, they just are, these two versions of the story are like just slamming together. Yeah. Well, reportedly, Andrew was a, quote, handsome child mm. with a precocious sparkle. But like his father, Andrew hid his Filipino heritage from other kids, although he would sometimes lean on that side of his background in the future when it became a convenient detail to his story. Like if he was playing, say, one of the things he would play is like the heir to a vast Filipino banana fortune. You would believe how much money's in peels. (laughs) It's crazy. It's like a drug over there. They love bananas. We have so many monkeys. We have so (laughs) many quality control orangutans. And and I'll kill one. I'll fucking the one looks at me sideways, I'll fucking shoot it in the head. <laughs> Sorry, daddy. Well, say what you will about Andrew Cunanan, but in his own way, he was brilliant. Yeah. He had an, <laughs> he had an IQ of 147. Yep. Yeah. He also- one plus four is five. Five plus seven is twelve. One plus two is three. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm funny. What's the highest IQ? I don't even, I don't I think even it's know. Like- 200. Yeah, 200? It's, bi- it's big. Yeah. Maybe it's, 300. I, I don't think it's 300. I Maybe think it's they, that's deep blue. Has anyone ever taken an IQ test here? Yeah. Yeah. You have? What, do you know what you got? Yeah, 132. Woo! I, I, I feel weird. Saying it? Yeah. What'd you get? I got 151. Fuck yeah. yeah. Hell yeah, bro. Kuni. Yeah, but this is a long time. Yeah, me and Makunani, we're the same. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but this was a long time ago. This was to get into gifted class. I think I'm a lot dumber now. Yeah. 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 I, I can't do math, so that took the score down considerably. Mm. I never yeah. even 
got offered to take the test. Yeah, I met this guy. Yeah, they just kind of looked at you and they're like, well, let's just say he's going into manual labor. They, it was nice of a mind. Yeah, it was like my test was really easy. I went in this room, right? And first of all, they put a bunch of blocks there and they asked a bunch of quick for your questions. That was really nice. And then this other guy came in and he was dressed. I'm, I'm going to say dressed as Bill Clinton. And um, he said something about like, have you ever played a recorder the French way? Oh, and I was like, no, I mean, I played it my way. We do it in school. And then like, I'm just start sucking this fucking guy's, this guy's and you apparently did it very intelligently. Yeah, you got yeah, it by going. I love this. <laughs> I'm not coming. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Andrew Kunanen <laughs> also had a penchant for reading the encyclopedia for fun when he was a kid. But while that does seem like bullshit, it sounds like a family story. Mm -hmm. I think that when you consider the fountain of knowledge that Andrew drew upon to create persona after persona, I think it is true. Well, he was a collector of things. I think he had a pointed intelligence. Yeah. That he collected ammo. This is like ammo. They yeah. were points of phrases. It's kind of like legitimately how I play characters on this fucking show. I take a couple of attributes. You know you're trying to play these various attributes. You know these things. If I was this guy, I'd know these 10 things. So yeah. he's doing character prep. But a lot of people say... There was one woman that read him to filth in this book. That's like, he was not that deep. He was just an expert in trivia. Yeah. And he, like, he did not have a broad grasp of concepts, but he knew what to say in a quick succession that allowed you to believe that he knew what he was talking about. Well, that's what all his teachers said. He yeah. said that his intelligence was entirely superficial. Near photographic memory, he could recall details, he could recall trivia, but he had no critical thinking skills. Well, because he didn't want... I feel like there's a difference between those that want to go deeper yeah, and those that don't. Where I think that he kind of felt like, I'm incredible. But he I'm pretty incredible, <laughs> so I don't really need all, like, I don't practice anything. I met this guy, and he taught me everything I really need to know about karate. I could literally, <laughs> I could fucking knock your arm out of its socket if you want. I'm gonna, my, my ligaments! <laughs> my ligaments! Cry from your grave. Hey there, dudes and dudettes. Time to wax up your boards and go catch the big wave over at the LPN Beach Blanket. 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 Bingo. Bingo. Bingo! One night only at the Balboa Theater in San Diego, October 20th. Come and check out all of the cool cats cat, 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 and the crazy, crazy dogs dog. at LPN. Every show in the entire network, each one pulsating and grinding in front of you for your entertainment pleasure. We're all going to catch the big kahuna. And I'm talking about that big greasy guy. I'm talking about a wave. Gee, it's seaweed. It's seaweed. Just so you know, it's going to be inside of a theater. So any physical wetness you experience is your own personal body heat or the sweat of one of the performers. Come and check it out. I'm certain if there's a podcast flavor you need on your tongue, we got the spoon for it. For live stream tickets, go to veeps.com slash L-P-O-T-L to watch from the comfort of your own home. Again, that's V-E-E-P-S dot com slash L-P-O-T-L. Beach blanket bingo, baby. Come on, girls, let's dance. Now, based on what Andrew learned from various books, he began telling wild stories about his background starting in junior high, setting himself apart by wearing suits, pressed khakis, argyle vests, and penny loafers. Andrew tried to weasel his way into the rich kid crowd by claiming he owned stock in Coca-Cola and Wrigley gum. Oh, so he got his ass kicked all the time. No, <laughs> it's funny, though. The he could talk his way out of anything. He yeah. really had, like, one of those, like, silver tongues where, like, people had a hard time pinning him down because he also kind of both... He used his weirdness as a way of kind of very similar, weirdly. I, I don't think he had as much control over it, but Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. The way Jeffrey Dahmer would act out in high school. Like, yeah. so when we covered Jeffrey Dahmer, we learned that he would, he became like a class character where he'd do weird shit. People would dare him to do stuff and he'd do it. And mm. they like, he gained a semi form of popularity. He actually, Andrew Cunanan realized that he could formulate a personality that like, 
people would be drawn to, but then the bad guys would kind of be repelled from because he would use his sort of like natural homosexuality. He would go into sort of a uh, flamboyant thing and it would do both. It would kind of deflect things from him. It's very weird. He could just confuse people. He probably would have been a great salesman. He would have been, he didn't yes. do anything. He literally had, didn't have a yeah, single no, tangible skill. Yeah, well, he didn't have a, a drive to work, it seems like. That's no. what it was. No, he would have been an absolutely incredible salesman. Yeah, he could have sold you a piece of shit car and you wouldn't even know what happened until a year later. But yeah. again, that's constructive. Yes. But while Andrew could spin a good yarn that attracted plenty of attention, everyone knew that he was full of shit. Nobody bought it. When he finally did convince a kid to be friends with him, Andrew's mother made sure to alienate anyone Andrew brought over to make sure the kid was good enough to be friends with her son. Oh, I don't know what this is like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Marianne would ask embarrassing, probing questions, things so personal that Andrew stopped bringing people over altogether. I'm so glad that you have spent some time with Andy. So tell me. Are you circumcised? I was literally thinking that exact thing. I was literally... <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> so you said you don't have any... Did your mother do that? Well, my mom... Did she, like, interview potential friends for you? It was just very... Uh, how do you put it? It's an overmothering thing. Mm. It's that she wants all the kids to... But it was more that my mom wanted the kids to be her friends. Yeah. Well, in this, okay, Andrew described his mother as overbearing and overloving, while mm. other others described her as... Over pampering. pampering. I fucking I hate that. I hate the term pamper. Pampering. Yeah. Because pampers, I mean, like there are lots of awful things. Oh, terrible things. Pampers. And just with pampers, like I just I feel like a mother who pampers pays a lot of attention to her son's butt. Can yeah. you imagine meeting a guy named Pampers? <laughs> oh yeah. It's just covered in his own piss. Hi. 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 <laughs> say it's lack of impulse control. I just say I can't hold my water. <laughs> Andrew's father, however, was a domineering, physically abusive man who trained his family to bow to his will so well that they would leave the living room when he wanted to eat dinner so he could do so while watching TV in silence. Kind of nice. Yeah. I mean, it's a man who knows what he wants. Yeah, it is. No. No children at dinner? Woo. I mean, that makes you want to have children. <laughs> so, you can, <laughs> so you can make them go away? <laughs> yeah. Feel that power? <laughs> But like his son, Modesto had delusions of grandeur and believed that he deserved far more than he had earned, especially after he started working as a phony baloney stockbroker years later. Well, he started legit. He got into like whatever this like stockbroker training program at Merrill Lynch. And so there was like a hot second where he kind of was a real stockbroker. For a bit, yeah. But then he immediately went further and further into fringe, quote unquote, stockbroking, which is kind of like. If you watch Wolf of Wall Street, yeah. you really can see like that was real, right? Like the idea of you can go from, you don't got to be on Wall Street to sell a bunch of stocks. You like a lot of times you're going to call from somebody and it sounds like there's like a busy office behind them, but that's literally because someone hit play on a recorder behind them and <laughs> it's like phone calls and stuff. And it's just a guy alone in his house. Oh, yeah. dude, I did that when I was 18. We would sell penny stocks and fucking, <laughs> yes. I, was in a, I was in a whole penny stock operation and I eventually stopped doing it. Yeah, they fired scams. me. Uh -huh. I felt so guilty that, like, I would just like not. I would tell people like, "Don't buy this." You know, like, <laughs> well, I was on the phone with them. You know, it's, it was crazy because, and they eventually got raided, and fucking the FBI came and everything. Yeah, because it's like, supremely illegal. Yeah, because it's called pumping and dumping. Uh -huh. Yeah, they were like, "Don't watch Boiler Room," and then gave us the exact speech from Boiler Room verbatim. Oh yeah, dude. <laughs> I oh, that's so funny. When I worked at the when the head hunting agency, I worked at head hunting. I've told the story before that down in financial district, they, they did the same thing where, where the during the onboarding process, he made us all sit and watch Boiler yeah. Room. Like, from that, to, and we was like, this is, they all, like, die at the end of this. Yeah, like, what are you this, doing? Yeah, this is, it's not good. Yeah. But even though Modesto was abusive, he was also toxically proud of Andrew's intelligence. And he wouldn't tell other parents that his child was better than theirs. He would tell other children that his son was better See, than that. Like <laughs> yeah, cool. See, all you, you're all fucking idiots. You're all garbage. <laughs> Do better. Be better. <laughs> Later, when the family moved to a new house, when Andrew was in high school, Andrew was given the master bedroom yeah. while his father slept on the couch and his mother took the maid's room. Presumably, this was after all of his other older siblings left home. He was treated special from the very beginning. That's crazy. It's is, weird. The other they they called the other two kids street kids, right? Like they like he had two older brothers and sisters, and they were like, 
they just were more like latchkey kids. They they were kind of just they, they were kind of left to their own devices, and they just were. As soon as he popped out the fucking pussy, they, they were immediately like, "He's amazing." No, how do you only have two bedrooms and ones for a maid? <laughs> It's <laughs> good point. Good point. Good point. <laughs> the strangest thing between Andrew and his father was the fact that they had pet names for each other. Did you find out what the pet names were? No, but I it was I remember it was like using cuckoo and poop with the call each other. I think their names were cuckoo and poop. I fucking love this. Did yeah. they oh we could hey cuckoo. Hey cuckoo. Hey poopoo. This is my boy poopoo. This is my daughter cuckoo. I'm cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm poopoo. I just know Eddie that you like the noise cuckoo. I, I know you just love going cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Yeah, yeah but I don't yeah. like baby talk within my relationship. Well, yeah. no, I like cuckoo as like uh, this person's crazy, like a cuckoo. Clock. Oh, yeah, cuckoo, cuckoo. cuckoo. I think that that yeah. should be come back as an official diagnosis of somebody. Yeah, and poo poo. I mean, I love poo poo. Of course, we all do. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, mean, I have to soften my poo poos are gross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I don't. I have to call it something cute in order to accept what happened. Yeah, you got to put some PR on that. <laughs> Well, adding to Andrew's strange inner world were the dreams he'd have as a child. He said that he had weird images of death and destruction, often involving his father or some other demon-like figure. Despite that, Andrew said that these dreams were as pleasurable as they were scary. Yeah, that yeah. doesn't sound like an affectation at all. It's not <laughs> definitely completely real. Well, like, nightmares are cool, you know? They're well, free horror movies. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> what we're going to see always. later on, what we're going to see is... This came from his brothers and sisters. He told this to them. I think a lot of the stuff that's going to come out, especially in this episode that he's talking about himself, is because he kind of was obsessed from very early on as portraying himself as mysterious, yeah. like unknowable, and a little bit like, I also might do bad things. Yeah. And like, you know, because the bad things he viewed as like, sexy like it was the and he's been setting up since he was like nine he was trying to be sexy since childhood yeah i didn't start till like 12 <laughs> <laughs> that fucking fooled me <laughs> you're sexy yeah well you know it's, it's a matter of opinion i just thought that julie just was just fine with it <laughs> and you just finally decided that you were stable enough to be there. Nah, I can't keep her off me. <laughs> God, this is about a. <laughs> now, even though the Kunanans were not well to do people, Modesto insisted on enrolling Kunanan into a $7,000 a year private school in San Diego called Bishops. This was where Andrew got his first taste of the high life whilst hobnobbing with wealthy students. Well, his father used to take him to the mall. And he'd say, like, you see this suit? This is a good label. And they would he would tell him all about like Armani, the difference between Armani and and for like not I don't know what was around at the time, but literally yeah. being like, you wear this, people will think that you're extremely important. And so for a while, his father was like literally funding this weird high role in lifestyle for his own son, where he would and they would match. They would buy matching suits. They would get they got matching cars together yeah. where they were like he's because he wanted his son to like look cool like next to him. And now but once he got to Bishops, he's starting to connect this thing in his fucking head that like as long as you think I'm this thing. Yeah, I am that thing. Well, fake it till you make it. Yes, mm -hmm. but you got to make it. If you keep faking it and 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 faking it, at some point, like, you end up under a bridge. Yeah. Now. He was like a shitty Bernie Madoff. Molesto. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. Maybe. By the way, we have to start calling him Molesto. Yeah, we gotta start calling him Molesto. <laughs> I know Molesto. he probably didn't do that, but... No, yeah. no, 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 no. no. <laughs> but from what it seems, these interactions only made Andrew more insecure angrier and more flamboyant. Yeah. For example, he once showed up to a school function wearing a tight red leather jumpsuit, which I imagine, I think, in my mind, it's like the one that Eddie Murphy wore during Delirious, Oh yes. which you know. is ironic considering how highly homophobic Delirious is. Also, how highly homophobic he was as a young man. There was a lot of also weird other stuff that he would start to do, and kind of stuff, but you mean walking around just being like, hey, you know, you know I'm half black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's the authenticity. You know it was all vinyl and not leather. Though, oh yeah, because oh. they were poor. You know, so yeah. it was just real <laughs> shitty clothes. I imagine. Well, we'll get into the. Uh, we'll actually get into why they were real. Like, okay. And what and what Modesto did to get that real shit. Molesto. 
Thank Molesto. You. Okay. Thank Molesto. You. I'm saying Modesto. You could say you're the you <laughs> proper. You yeah. can say Modesto, and then we'll just correct you every time. <laughs> <laughs> but in the more embarrassing realm, Kunanen would also try to entertain his classmates by aping lines and bits he'd memorized from episodes of Mork and Mindy. Oh, nanu nanu. <laughs> <laughs> Do you fucking remember? Do you remember the show? <laughs> no, this is when. Mork and Mindy was like on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Jonathan Winters, man, is great in that show. God, damn, very another very sad man. Ever. Extremely sad man. Was he sad? Oh yes, he we, he actually put himself in a mental hospital two or three times during his life. Really intense depression. He was one of the funniest people who've ever lived. Yeah, it's almost like there's a current of sadness that runs through people <laughs> that uh, do comedy professionals. I wonder what that's all about. When it came to telling wild stories, though, Andrew quickly learned that the best way to get attention was to be openly gay. Although his way of being openly gay was describing sexual encounters in graphic detail, whether anyone wanted to hear about it or not. Yeah. And gay or straight, that's just a guaranteed way to make everyone uncomfortable. Hey, no kids, one wants to hear it. hey kids, you guys do the English homework? Yeah. <laughs> you guys ever have your asshole licked by his tugboat camp? <laughs> More like a yank boat, Captain. <laughs> yeah, I got I got statutorily raped last night. <laughs> I made him a criminal <laughs> just by making him come. You ever put testicles in your nostrils? <laughs> you wouldn't believe your smell does not go back to normal for like six hours. He's also he was just straight up fucking vulgar. He'd say that his two favorite things in life was sex and defecation. Oh yeah. His, his favorite line was this is his favorite line. There's nothing like a good crap. I mean, we talk about our craps all the time. Yeah, we but do. he's a spree killer who killed Gianni Versace. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew also claimed that he was having a sexual relationship with the father of one of his fellow classmates. All of these are crimes. Yeah. It's like, again, yeah. he's a walking series of crimes. Yeah. But while the classmate angle might not be true, Andrew almost certainly had an arrangement with a wealthy older man when he was a minor. Yeah, he's calling me an altar man <laughs> in the house. I'm like his little butler. With two T's. Come on, everybody. High, <laughs> high, kicks, high kicks. Funniest guy in the fucking room. Will somebody pick up the fucking slack? <laughs> <laughs> Despite coming from a home with a modest income, Andrew began showing up with expensive watches and jewelry. Can you Should imagine a child covered with an older man's jewelry? <laughs> he's like, I mean, that was he's about 15 like. at this time. He's enough. He's enough. He's a of teenager. A child. Yeah. He's a teenager. Yeah. But still, it's, yeah, it's not an eight year old showing up with a pinky ring. He was sucking dick back then, I guarantee. I don't know. I guarantee. He, he said that he lost his virginity when he was 13 to an older boy in a San Diego public park. Mm. Oh, okay. Ooh, Good okay. Is there a Hallmark card for that? <laughs> <laughs> you can send? At least it wasn't SeaWorld. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that worse? <laughs> Well, quite possibly, Andrew met his first of many sugar daddies at one of San Diego's gay bars, which Andrew began frequenting at the age of 15. Thinking for some reason that being Latino was sexier or more accepted than being Filipino, Andrew started creating Hispanic characters for himself, like David Morales or Andrew Da Silva. Andrew mm. Da Silva. That was his favorite. Yeah, well, the Da Silva came from, so during his time at Bishop, I'm tracking in vulgar favors. There's interesting like arc here where there was a pair of twins that were at uh, this school that he latched onto, and this family they like they would kind of like he'd portray like at his home like his father was so busy, his parents were so busy that they you know they were never around, and so they did that thing which I don't know if you had like uh, my older sister had we had a friend her friend like lived with us for like two years. Yeah, oh we yeah, had, yeah we had one I of those was too. the kid who lived with other families. Yes, nice. yes. We, had, we had two of them. Yeah, I, it was actually kind of, we had three of them. It's a me, very me mid and all my brothers all had a guy. I yeah. don't know why that it's something it was something about the early nineties. Yeah, you know where that happened quite a bit. Well, you were just, back then, you were just allowed to go to someone's house and yeah, not yeah. call ahead. Yeah, you know, you Now, if to... you show up at someone's house and don't call ahead, you get fucking killed. Yeah, I'm literally going to call the police. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, this, he kind of fit his way into this twin's life, and they had a lot of money. And the, the Silva came from this family that oh. he kind of got attached to. They were called the Rafats. There was somebody else that was in there. I forgot, but the, he learned that name, and then he started using that name to sort of create this other character, because they were rich, and they did have access, and they did travel the world, and they did all these things, and he immediately started to understand this, like, okay, if I insinuate myself a bunch of people and just act just like them as a mirror 
they are looking at themselves in me. Yeah. And this is it's like you kind of watch the the slowly but surely this like thing c- c- like grow inside of him. Mm hmm. Well, with each new name came a new story. And with each crowd came a new persona that was tailor made on the spot to fit right in. Oh, yeah. This, however, created a kind of identification crisis. Back at school, Andrew found that he'd lied so much that people actually didn't know who he was. You didn't know who Andrew Cunanan was. You knew Andrew De Silva or you knew David Morales. All the other kids knew for sure was that that guy had a creepy laugh <laughs> <laughs> and delusions of grandeur that he would one day be rich and famous without ever being able to articulate how. And that is a common thread, especially in our incredibly, incredibly wonderful business. Yeah. In show business, that idea of faking it till you make it is honestly really important. I think that that's one of those things where you, you kind of have a lofty aspiration, but most people work really hard yeah and then you either like get some version of your dream or you like find another avenue where you you oh like oh actually my skills are more in like casting or my skills are over here my skills are in production i'm doing these other things and you find your place in it by again constructive actions doing things that actually give something to the business and but somebody like him kind of just believes i'm just gonna sit here and everybody's gonna line fucking up (laughs) <laughs> to put me on a goddamn billboard. Yep. Eventually, though, people must have put together the character of Andrew Cunanan because his superlative in his high school yearbook was least likely to be forgotten. You'll never <laughs> fucking forget me! <laughs> 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 like <laughs> Henry's was uh, most likely to get his arm stuck in a candy machine. That <laughs> is... <laughs> I fought that in court. I had to. I was like, this is fucking, you are smearing my name. So after high school, Andrew enrolled at UC San Diego, where he did very poorly. Instead of going to class, Andrew was either nursing hangovers from partying the night before or playing hooky so he could hang outside of construction sites to ogle the workers. Fuck, Fuck yes. <laughs> see, that, this is good. That's so, like, just throwing it back at him. Can you imagine just an entire construction crew of pedophiles just with, like, all the, they're all working with their oiled muscles, just yeah. watching all the teenage boys going, hi. And they're like, yeah, like letting their muscles yeah. jiggle around the jackhammers and shit. Yeah, swing that hammer, you piece of shit. And he's being like, uh, uh, I don't want it anymore. Where's the head of the crew? <laughs> Bring your mom back. <laughs> but really, the lesson that Andrew was learning above all during college was that life could be relatively easy for a good looking, charming young gay man if you just found the right guy to take care of you. Amen. But as Andrew focused on who else? Amen. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Send me up. Say it again. But as Andrew focused on who else but older men who were usually closeted, he began to realize how he could survive completely on charm and bullshit. Rather than becoming an escort, which he could have very easily gotten into that world, Andrew positioned himself as a quote unquote companion. Huh. Put another way, Andrew was learning how to be a kept boy. And it's about. There's always a question about how purposeful actions are in anybody's life, right? I feel like something like this is like, do you set out to be a kept boy? Because again, doesn't sound really safe in there. You know what I mean? When you're kept all the time. But I feel like he might have just sort of move that way. Well, there's different types of kept boys. Like yeah. there are certain kept boys who uh it is not encouraged that they leave the house. Yeah. Uh mm. they are encouraged to stay at home much of the time. Sounds kept awesome. boy kept boy can also mean someone who gets an allowance. Uh, but you must know that you are my boy and okay. nobody else's boy and you All must right. and you must be there when yeah. I ask you to be there. Yeah, yeah, balloons. Well, <laughs> opportunity meets preparedness. <laughs> <laughs> Seneca. Can I get a big lollipop? (laughs) But in order to stay in the high social circles into which these older men were welcoming him, Andrew found ways to blend in by knowing what forks to use at dinner or what political figures he could discuss to surprise people with his knowledge on foreign affairs. Fillard Billmore. (laughs) Have you heard of him? (laughs) Yeah, he was the 47th president and he was the first gay man to ever fire a cannon. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's uh, it's pretty, it's pretty on the fucking money. And if you dare double check me, I will fucking yeah. shoot you in the fucking head. <laughs> Well, by 1987, Andrew found himself in the circle of a fraternal organization called Gamma Mu, which is kind of like the gay version of the Elks Lodge. I think okay. the Elks Lodge is the gay version of the Elks Lodge. That's no. Kiwanis. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to get sued. <laughs> no, no, that, no, that's gay businessmen. Yeah. No, you're thinking of the Shriners. Yo, you need to tell me. Nobody has new, two men with fezes who yeah. haven't had full on doggy style on top of a pool table yeah. in most Elks Lodges across this country. So it turns out those red hats are just filled with cops. Yeah, they're cops. <laughs> Well, today, Gamma Mu is an out and proud charity organization who gives scholarships to young LGBT kids in rural communities. It's a noble cause. Yeah, Their website has a distracting number of rainbows on it. Yeah, great. Yeah. But back in Andrew Kunanen's time, Gamma Mu was, it did charity nonetheless, but it was made up mostly of wealthy, closeted men. Okay. And Andrew became a popular boy to pass around when he entered in 1987. But by like, he actually became a member in 1994, yeah. like a, a few years, but like after college, I, you know, when he was starting to get a, much better at being like fancy boy into fancy man. Honestly, yes. I, I prefer if you were going to pass me around, can you get that spiral tight? <laughs> because I am sick of hitting my head on the fucking fan. All right. And ass first, please. <laughs> if we could. I'm sick of kissing all these strangers. Put the ass and pass. <laughs> Well, through this rotating cast of lovers, Andrew eventually got into BDSM. Ooh, nasty. About time. Yeah, it's not nasty. Nasty. It's you not- know, according to Vulgar Favors, nasty. Oh, my God. Dark it's vulgar world vulgar of Favors. S&M. It just treats, Vulgar Favors treats BDSM as like the worst thing. It leads to violence. It's so filthy and dirty. Only the worst people in the world engage in BDSM. It's because they haven't come. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. Like they just don't come. You can get spanked, dog. Yeah. yeah. And we met the founders of kink.com. They're great. And God damn, were they nice people. BDSM probably curbs violence. Yeah. I don't know. You know what? I think it's completely separate. I just yeah. think you could put clamps in your nipples. And as long as you're doing it to yourself or somebody who's going, yeah, buddy, yeah, then like, you know, rock and roll. Have yeah. at it. Just leave me alone at the farmer's market. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick of these guys trying to hang these clothespins off of me. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking impractical jokers. <laughs> well, Andrew said in his own purposefully shocking way that BDSM reminded him of what his father had done to him when he was a young boy. Molesto? <laughs> Mr. Molesto. And I told yeah. my father, honestly, while he was doing it, he's like, listen, I know how to cover us here. I'll start smiling. <laughs> <laughs> because then, honestly, daddy, then it's just bonding. <laughs> And now maybe I can go for molesto sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Every other time will be molesto. Thank How's you. about that? I Thank appreciate you. you. Of course, I appreciate you. <laughs> He's dead, right? Molesto? Yeah. I yeah, maybe. Well, we'll find out. We'll, we'll find we'll, out we'll, soon. We'll, yeah, we'll, <laughs> keep an eye on the mailbox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not surprisingly, Andrew loved BDSM and he soon became a popular dom, although he could switch back and forth. Again, mm-hmm. this is allegedly. Allegedly. Meanwhile, Andrew's father, Modesto, was seeing that while lying about being successful is easy. Oh, yeah. Actually being successful is pretty mm-hmm. difficult mm-hmm. in the stockbroker game. Yeah. In fact, Modesto was like, okay. Molesto was lucky <laughs> every other time. He was lucky he didn't land in jail for the shit he pulled. See, Modesto wanted to indulge Andrew in all of his expensive tastes the best he could. He even went as far as to buy him this fancy Mazda. Oh, yeah. He said it's the only one. The only one ever made in San Diego. The only like, Mazda? Yeah. It's <laughs> the only Mazda in San Diego. It was a nice Mazda. <laughs> form of like sports car Mazda. Yeah. 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 No, that's a nice It's Mazda. a real fancy Mazda. You know, it's like how, you know, I love Subarus and I, I only drive like Subaru Outbacks, but then yeah. there's like these like really expensive like Subaru sports cars that people soup up. Who like in the that. living fuck? <laughs> Would buy a Subaru sports car. Dude, I guess when Elizabeth Warren turned seventy-five, is a lesbian haircut. <laughs> it's, been, it's been it's been noted. Hey man, I'm telling you, there are it, there's going to be so many emails about Subaru sports cars, Subaru like, racing cars. Subaru it's a big does. Thing. They do a good job. They They're do fine. racing cars. Yeah. They do racing cars. We've just yes, I have received the Subaru fam. 
yeah. like motions. I've seen, I've received. Much better than a fucking Acura. I'll tell you that much. Sure. We can agree on that. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> but the cash for all this shit, for the Mazda, for all the clothes, for everything came from embezzled funds. Ah. See, Molesto had a scheme where he'd take money from his clients. I'm still keeping. I'm keeping it in my I head. Appreciate, no, I'm following. <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna, we're gonna change it for next next episode. <laughs> they tell them they he would tell them that he was buying a stock, but the stock didn't exist. He just makes something up, and then he keep the money for himself. And it's um, it's a dumb scam. Yeah, because eventually, eventually, someone's going to say, "Hey, where's my money?" Yeah. Yeah, I just I remember when I worked at Dairy Queen, there was this one kid who would just steal out of the fucking register, and it's like there is a process to stealing. Yeah, yeah. you yeah, know, yeah. like you have to at least try to like do like some kind of process it, to stealing. It is a job to yeah, be yeah. a quote unquote <laughs> professional criminal. Like it's a job. It takes due diligence, yeah. and you didn't think about it. But that guy's probably now in like the House of Representatives. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or dead. It's Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Far more likely. <laughs> No, I'm a, but, God damn it. You don't you're have on, to. Uh, you're you know, on Modesto, by the way. Thank you. You're on- <laughs> <laughs> no, Modesto could usually keep these schemes going at various firms for a couple of years, but he'd always get caught and he'd always get fired. Because I don't think he took very much money at, t- at a time. Because if you've got a client that's investing like five, six dollars $600,000 and you say like, hey, there's this stock for, you know, like, ba bum ba bum yeah. And then you can give me a thousand dollars, you know, and I'll put it in bum 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 bum. And he just, and, he and just then, sneaks it. Yeah, he just sneaks it in and they forget all about the stupid stock that he made up. Yeah. Or he probably then would send back fake returns where he'd go and he'd say, Lo, look, Lighten this fake thing like is Bernie going Madoff. great. That's Bernie Madoff. But I don't know if he even went that far. It's it's also interesting that within the world of stockbrokers, the scamming so thick at this time, especially, yeah. and it's so prevalent that they, they they just treat you like a Catholic priest where they just kick you to the to another district. Yep. They just go like, all right, well, you've done too many crimes to work here still, <laughs> but you could go work over at Mr. T's fun stock house. You know, <laughs> yeah. some garbage. But also when you're investing like 500 grand and you lose $1,000, like you're not going to care. You don't uh, know. Unless you're a yeah. psycho, unless you, you do care. Yeah, I mean, some and that's people, how you get fired. Yeah, some people do pay attention, and, and it was usually when someone would pay attention, they would see like, oh shit, yeah, this guy's stealing money. And then if you're the guy who runs the company, you don't want the bad press of stockbroker from such and such firm just hanging you know, out, uh, arrested for you know Embezzled. misappropriating yeah. funds. Well, pretty soon, Molesto's wife Marianne realized that there must be some scam going on, but Modesto denied everything. He said that the securities business is the most regulated industry there is. And how could a man nominated in the 1986 California Who's Who of stockbrokers ever be considered a failure? It turns out. Him. Well, it turns out that wasn't real. It was more of a who's who of. Who's that? <laughs> uh, because there was him. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, that uh, no, that was not real. And no. also, technically, that was the same exact defense that our former president just gave. Yeah, he literally just said it, being like, "How could I possibly have cheated all these people? This is the most regulated industry. They should have stopped me." <laughs> Isn't <that> great. <laughs> this is a great fucking country, man. You just got to figure out how to scam. Yeah. But a failure he was. And after losing his last stockbroker job for misappropriating over $100,000, he sold his family home up from under his wife and moved back to the Philippines. Didn't yeah, even dude. tell her he was doing it. He uh. literally, like, it's like, kissed her to, like goodbye. Be like, going to work. Never saw him again. Mm-hmm. Sold everything. Sold the whole house. Left them with $700. Yeah. Now, while his wife was shocked, Andrew, as it turned out, had been the mastermind behind this plan all along. Now, this is according to one of the books. Yes. That doesn't in this one, it says in vulgar favors, it says that that he didn't know. Right. So we don't know. But it's one of those where the father was so up the ass of the son that they like, who knows? I wouldn't put it past Andrew to have known. But it, but then there are, you know, we'll find out. Because it, it ended up ruining his life. Contradictions. Contradictions. 
while Andrew figured that he and his dad could move to the Philippines and start a business that had not yet been determined. Yeah, that's always a good way to go in. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, especially in the Philippines. All right, think about this. <laughs> drive through chicken and bullets? <laughs> oh. All right, what if you could get gasoline in a bucket? Yeah. <laughs> chains, we'll just sell chains. Chains, chains, chains. Everybody needs chains. People need chains. <laughs> what we do know is that Marianne was understandably irate about the double betrayal. And it's here that we get the first taste of Andrew's capacity for violence. When Marianne accused Andrew and Modesto of conspiring against her, which they were, Andrew slammed her against a wall so hard that he dislocated her shoulder. Say that again, bitch! Yeah. Jesus fucking Christ. From what the neighbor who saw the whole thing said, it was a quick, violent snap that just as quickly burned out. Because... Yeah. Real Andrew came out. Yeah. That's the thing. This is well, This is one of those where you start to understand when the center is hollow, what the hollowness then becomes is something very bad. Like it is not, it never turns into a fun hollow. Phil Hartman. I think he's the closest <laughs> to a fun hollow. Yeah. yeah. You know, where like, that's what I always said, that there was no Phil Hartman. You mm. know what I mean? Like he was just this collection of characters that literally like, he was a very interesting kind of solitary man, but mostly when he wasn't on, he was just kind of quiet and he kind of just sat there, you know? He filled um, his hollowness with laughter. With laughter. Yeah. Well, that's what I try to do yeah. with the hollowness inside. Mm. But his is filled with um, pure violence. Yeah. Violence, rage. Usually it is. Yeah. There's probably a lot of violent things this guy did that we will never know about. Oh, absolutely. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Soon after that altercation, Andrew joined his father in the Philippines, where Andrew quickly discovered that he'd given up a relatively easy life in America to live in a shack, much like the one that the nice Filipino lady in the most recent season of Before mm -hmm. the 90 Days lived in before her elderly mother fell and fatally broke her neck in the middle of filming because their shack was so dangerous. Wow, Jeez. that's very, it's extremely sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely sad for television. <laughs> they're, the, they're the best couple on the season. They're probably the best couple that's been on, on 90 Day Fiance in, in years. Yeah, because there's real trauma in there. And that gives it the juice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because they're sweet and they obviously love each other. Oh, and wow. they're both kind people. Well, mm. I'm watching Love is Blind. Oh, that's nice. It's stupid. I saw I saw <laughs> Naked Attraction. I fucking hated it. Yeah, but I like seeing all the dicks and all the pussies. I saw. It would, yes, that is the point of the show is there's uh, dicks and pussies, but it's so hollow. The oh, show. wow. They really do show the. Oh, oh yeah. dude, it starts with like, there's just like in a little box and then they raise the front door and it's just like six cocks. I am really. And she's like, get rid of that cock. I honestly wow. think. And then they truly... turn around, they show the ass. She's oh, like, yeah. get rid of that ass. Wow. That's and awesome. then it goes up and it shows like the, their tits and their stomach. They're like, oh, that guy looks like shit. Get rid of that. It's the most super official fucking show that ever existed. And then when they finally talk, when they finally <laughs> talk, they ask them what their least favorite part of their body is. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it is the most My mind. super... <laughs> um, I, uh, I think I could tell if you're a good or bad person by your butt. Really? Yep. Well, if it's filled with shit, that's probably a bad sign. Yep. Or you've got a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's too busy to wipe. <laughs> well, basically, Andrew was living in third world conditions with no electricity or running water. Oh, uh, yeah. It's like people travel by chicken here. <laughs> I need to, I need out. Is there a Hilton? No. He mm. had to wash his clothes in a ditch. Hey, and he ew. bathed once a week in a public swimming pool. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey. And he soon discovered that Modesto's business was selling cast off junk on street corners. Just shit. It's so crazy. Yeah. Honestly, I can't be in a place where all of the cleaning is wet. I'm going to need some dry <laughs> ass cleaning, right? Because most of my stuff is silk. He, I, he, once he saw that his father, this like popped a massive bubble. Yeah. Right. Because again, his father was the, that fed him and fueled him. His father fed and fueled him of all his fan, these fantasies, like this idea. And that was kind of the first time I think him sort of understanding like, Oh, just because the fantasy's there and you're walking in the shoes and then the clothes of the fantasy really doesn't mean that it's real. Yeah. Well, that's probably why he attacked his mother because he knew he was doing the wrong fucking thing. Well, he's starting to understand that like all of these things that have been relatively harmless and these kind of little minor personal scams I've been running have really not like affected my life in any way. And now I'm kind of seeing like, oh, this might be like for serial 
Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. this might be pretty, like, all the real, real one. And he didn't want to face it. It's definitely yeah. a wake-up call when your Mazda gets switched out with a rickshaw. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I am sick of this, like, two-foot horse drive. Like, I can't have this. <laughs> all right? I smelled my driver's ass. <laughs> well, Andrew quickly realized that he'd made a huge mistake, but had no money for a plane ticket back to America. He soon cooked up another scheme. See, as opposed to America, the Philippines has a unique view on gender and homosexuality that's fascinating, but far too complicated to go into here fully. It's a yeah, long, let's not. long history. We don't need to try to do I it. I have a lot of experience <laughs> with this. Let, please let Eddie explain yeah. the third gender yes. in the Filipino community. I've gone from lady boy to woman man. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> But to put it into the context of our story, there's a third gender recognized in the Philippines called bakla, which is not transgender, but rather involves men who adopt a gender expression that's feminine. Things are just more, they're more fluid there. They understand that more intrinsically. Yeah. yeah. People who identify as bakla are mostly gay, but not always. Yeah. And and people who identify as bakla have been integrated into and accepted by Filipino culture long before the colonization of their land in the 16th century by the hated Spaniards. I hate you Spaniards. (laughs) (laughs) But Andrew Cunanan didn't care about any of that history. Instead, he took advantage by shaving his entire body, styling his hair into a short bob, (laughs) donning a skirt, slapping on tights, and climbing into some high pumps so he could present himself as a bakla sex worker. I bet he looked great. Bugs Bunny. Actually, they did say that he looked pretty fantastic. Well, he was <laughs> like there was some that some people did see some pictures and they're like, wow. He yeah. truly <laughs> it, it was a shapeshifter. Yeah. And he understood what he needed to do. I, I mean, again, this is conjecture. So because that guy who wrote the other book is way more like, yeah, way more into the the sexual history yeah. of Andrew Cunan. And we're like, this doesn't cover any of that stuff. This is way more of the other side of the shapeshifting. But when you see what he does, I wouldn't put it past him necessarily. Yeah. And so, after three months earning cash as a fake bakla, Andrew had saved up enough money to pay for a one-way ticket back to San Diego. By this time, though, his father couldn't have cared less whether Andrew stayed or went, and their relationship more or less ended there. Now, after San Diego lost its charm, Kunanan moved to the center of American gay culture by relocating to the Castro District in San Francisco in 1989, when the AIDS crisis was at its absolute worst. As a simple fancy boy from San Diego, however, Kunanan found that the tightly knit gay scene in San Francisco didn't have much interest. So Andrew created the first of his more attention grabbing characters. God, God. See, Andrew Kunanan had learned street magic in Manila, and in between clients, he'd refined and perfected those skills. And watch, you'll see, as I paint it to the hands, paint it to the hands, <laughs> little hands, right? There's a pigeon in my butt. <laughs> yeah, it's that easy. Oh, well, it seemed to have exficiated, but it's because it was weak. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Kunan imposed as a naval officer on leave who casually performed magic tricks in bars. Yeah, I like some people call me a naval officer, but I prefer myself more of a belly button man. <laughs> <laughs> this persona was not so subtly named. Lieutenant Commander Cummings. Mm. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. yes. The great catchphrase. <laughs> See more of our NFSs. Yes. Our non fungible sounds. sounds yeah. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Well. <laughs> what noises with the boys? Well. It's another episode. <laughs> <laughs> from your grave. But the thing about Kunanan is that when he adopted a new persona, he went all in. When he became Lieutenant Commander Cummings, he wore a military crew cut, worked on his biceps, yep. and got a tan, just as a man who spent his days in the open sea might. And I spray salt on me. Um, it's not just the cum. <laughs> My name is Lieutenant Commander Penis Cummings. And I uh you know, stand to attention. Yep. Up oh, at ease. Not that much ease. <laughs> Not that much ease. You're fucking ease. <laughs> All right, we are uh, still at the hot dog store. <laughs> to give it a veneer of reality, each character even had their own quirks. Cummings, for example, claimed to never drink and refused all offers mm. to buy him a drink, saying that his worst vice was the occasional cigar, mm. which is, of course, 
another phallic reference. Nothing yes. I like to get a nice, long, thick, brown cube, and I like to just <laughs> snap the ends of it all. You know what I'm saying? Because it all starts about snapping the end of the end of it. You just get all the hairs inside your body. <laughs> Am I being too on the nose? <laughs> I'll suck your dick. That's not, I mean, in the end, but I also could use a cigar. But what was incredible was that whether Andrew Cunanan was himself, Lieutenant Commander Cummings, or his Latino persona, Andrew Da Silva, nobody in the scene knew that these were all the same person. And that's a really smart thing if you're trying to run a bunch of scams or mm. you're trying to do a bunch of other fucked up shit because then no one can, no one's doing the, because small communities cross-reference. Yeah. Right? The people will ask me, have you met this fucking guy? Have you seen this thing? It's like, if you're five different guys. No. So do you think he met the same person in different characters and they didn't notice? Absolutely. Again, because wow. they're having too much fun to give a shit that you're running an arcane series of minor personal scams, right? They're yeah. more just like, all right. You know what I mean? You meet these like weird kind of like We've met these guys. I also not you're it's a dark bars, you know, and like shit like that, you know. So you're not paying it. You're no. drunk, you know. You don't know who you're meeting, and you're half hammered. Yeah. yeah, and I mean that's what they always said about Ted Bundy. Is yes, that that's why Bundy's like if you look at every sketch of Ted Bundy, every single one of them is wildly different. Wow. And when people would describe him, they describe him in wildly different ways. And if you look at different pictures of him, like he looks different in almost every picture. Yeah, and they found him because of his teeth, right? No, uh, but they convicted him because of his teeth. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah he he had escaped from jail. By that point, once he had escaped from jail, like that was when he they, they, they he went into full berserker mode. That was they had a lot on him. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was uh, they it was the matching the teeth to the, the one marks. of the bite marks in the Tallahassee, you know, in the Florida State mm. uh, murder. Yes, but what was clear was that Kunanen could instantly judge what cover story a stranger would accept from the moment he met them, which would have made him an incredible con man if he wasn't so erratic and short-sighted. Or literally just a legit salesman. Yeah. Now, to make ends meet in San Francisco while he waited for the perfect older man to take care of him, Kunanen got a job in a restaurant kitchen, but soon found he could make money on the side selling weed. What but a monster. <laughs> What a despicable person. <laughs> who would ever who would ever do such a thing? <laughs> That's what I was about to say. What did you do, Ed? I believe that was your life exactly. <laughs> what did you do? But soon Kunanan began to realize that if he wanted to attract the upper class in San Francisco, he had to, to appear more conservative and mature. He couldn't be a fucking dude working at a B-dubs hanging out with a bunch of sketch comedians. Hey! Yeah. Hey! Hell yeah. But sometimes it leads to more of that. <laughs> <laughs> Using his fancy boy persona, Andrew weaseled his way into the San Francisco Opera House on a frequent basis, where he allegedly mingled with who else but... Robin Williams. Incredible. Very cool. Oh, 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 but the San Francisco Opera was also where Andrew Cunanan allegedly met Gianni Versace. See, this is where I th I think it's absolute horseshit. Uh, really? Maybe, maybe I think not. It's, I think it's entirely horseshit. We I think that know. he did not meet Gianni Versace at all. Well, from what friends later said, Cunanan was obsessed with Versace. And as the story goes, Cunanan met the fashion designer after the opening of a Strauss opera named Capriccio. Yeah, whatever, man. Which you read the fucking, you read the excerpt from it at the top whatever, of the man. episode. I'd rather have, I thought Capriccio was that thing with the flat meat. Yeah. <laughs> Carpaccio. Carpaccio. <laughs> yeah, That's Carpaccio. Like. Yes, yeah. I like Carpaccio. No, this yeah, was Carpaccio. the final yeah. opera that Strauss ever wrote. And it begged the question, which is the greater art? Poetry or music? Ugh, who gives a fucking <laughs> shit? Music. Music. Yeah, no one likes poetry. But also poetry is in music. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so what point. does it fucking matter? It's the same shit. Ah, but does that not beg the question of another of questions? <laughs> <laughs> Carpaccio. <laughs> 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 But regardless of <laughs> opera themes, Kunanen told his friends that he met Versace and that the meeting had gone great. Great! Of great. course. Ver it went great. Versace allegedly asked Kunanen if they'd met before. Perhaps at a house party on Lake Como? Yes. Johnny Versace was absolutely interested in this man he just met. There's no way. He was Gianni very tight-bodied. 
He was fine. Gianni Versace was around every single supermodel man that ever was. He was an extremely powerful yeah. person. He was also extremely like they're like a mob family. Like they mm-hmm. were all like like the idea of them even being he was five feet of Gianni Versace was probably extremely difficult. Kunanen, of course, emphatically said, yes, yes. <laughs> you do know me from that lake party at Lake Como. Do you remember when we called it Lake Como? <laughs> do you remember? <laughs> Sorry, that was my other guy. I painted him. <laughs> <laughs> and a short conversation was had before Versace shook him off like every celebrity did after two minutes in Andrew's presence. He latched on and they're like, get this fucking guy away from me. Have you ever <laughs> seen the old Project Runway of Heidi Klum? So you know how like they used to have every single... Every contestant of every reality story always has some some sort of like sob story, of course, right? something always, some yeah. kind of tragedy. Yeah. yeah, and so having somebody tell, like, looking at Heidi Klum's face <laughs> while someone's trying to be like, you know, and my my brother he lost his legs and in, in a car accident, and she's just going, mm. <laughs> you know, like I love Heidi, I but do they I. don't ca- they don't care. No. They just like they are very they know what they they're like. Okay, they've heard it all before. They've heard it all. They've before. heard it all. That encounter, however, if it did happen, would be the last time that the two of them would see each other until Kunanen showed up at Versace's Miami home seven years later with a Taurus 40 caliber handgun. That's a big gun. I wish it's it was. It's actually a very small gun. Really? Yeah. Well, well, really. I wish it was cupcakes. <laughs> we'll get into it. But yes, it's, a, it's actually made for concealed carry. Oh, okay. Now, for a while, Kunanen was heavily involved in the San Francisco gay BDSM scene. Yes. Acting as a master at clubs like Hellbound, oh, Sodom, okay, my favorite, Bondage a Go Go. So do you guys, um, <laughs> do you guys do like a wing night <laughs> at Bondage a Go Go? They might. Hey, listen, yeah. is anybody playing the game in here? Or just because the Pacers are on. I don't know if you. Oh, oh goodness me! I'm getting whipped. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lordy Lou! I thought that this was gonna be a nice. I honestly, at first thought I saw Hellbound, and my brain saw Bennigan's. I thought I was about to get a Monte Cristo. When you told me we were gonna play darts, I didn't know. I, know I was the board. Come on! And he keeps eating the twenty. Man, he's good. <laughs> It was even rumored back in the day that there were two low-budget Andrew Cunanan BDSM porn flicks circulating around San Francisco in which Cunanan adopted the slave position and got gang-banged in staged rape scenes. There's a lot of people that honestly, it was really, some of this, you know, obviously it was pretty extreme, but in one, I played a guy named Sean, and honestly, it was like, that was just kind of a good exploration for me. It was nice to step outside of myself. And then the other one where I played, it was called uh, Thunder Down Under, and I played a guy called the gork <laughs> and it really was on it they gave me a line which was amazing which was ow ow hey now you know and, uh, i thought i was pretty good you could barely tell i wasn't getting raped you could barely tell that's how good i was they were a bit heavy-handed at times <laughs> but even though people on various message boards have claimed to have seen sure. at least one of these videos no evidence of their existence has ever surfaced. Ooh. Until now. And here we go. <laughs> ow. 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 Hey, now. Hey. Joel's such a great researcher. <laughs> ow. Yeah. No, I'm the gork. He did actually look. He did. Like, that was one of his notes. He was like, yeah, there's a couple guys on message board, so they saw it. I couldn't find it. No, yeah. man. I'm, I'm glad he looked. I yeah. mean, if there was, a, I mean, if there was an Andrew Kunan and gangbang, like, staged rape scene. We'd we would, see it at this point. We would all know about it. Yeah. Boy George has a copy of yeah. it. <laughs> there, if it is anywhere. It is on a reel-to-reel in his basement. <laughs> I don't want to go anywhere near that rumpus room. <laughs> Eventually, though, Kunanen moved back to San Diego in the summer of 1991 to live with his mother. Her life had not gotten any better since Modesto had sold the house from underneath her. And no she way. And she spent most of her time chain smoking while idly threatening to kill herself. Oh, can you monetize that? <laughs> I'm thinking about that. Strangely, though, when Kunanen took on his next persona... It was that of a poor history student at UC San Diego who wanted nothing more than to educate himself, but did not have the means to do so. Wow, he went humble. Well, I mean, it could be one of two things. It could be that he was experimenting, but it could also be that he did, I not, need money. He did not have Modesto anymore there yeah, to give yeah. him cash. He didn't have a sugar daddy set up yet. And so he had no choice, but yeah. he still could not be 
on Andrew Kunan. He, he still definitely could not just be some guy. He could have got a job. Yeah. He got one of those once. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. You know what, though? This sucks. Yeah. So I understand. Oh, yeah. Especially no one's ever kitchen paid, work. No one's ever paid me to just be there. No. You know, most of the time, they I have to be working or they ask me to leave. You got to do something. I was going to say, you guys are kind of paying me to do that. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> It's a special set of circumstances. <laughs> but once Kunanen found another older man to support him, this time with an allowance of $2,000 a month, the poor college student routine was dropped and Kunanen went wild with aliases. Yeah, because that's boring. Yeah. On one night, you might meet Kurt Matthews Damaris. Ooh. On another, you'd meet Drew Cunningham. Ooh. And every once in a while, Andrew would bring back Lieutenant Commander Cummings. <laughs> 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 I don't always find ejaculation to be so horrible as the two of you make. Well, no, it. it's, it's just because it can sometimes be a. Huh? You see, yeah. no, most of the time it's like God. I'm just, uh, just yeah. a, my poor wife. Yeah, no, it <laughs> usually comes with face. a sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just like yeah, because you know what it is. It's like it's that moment because like you know I'm not silent, but yeah. it's not like. You know, you I don't do it. I'm a go. You know what I mean, I do that on the show. But in real life, it's mostly just like, ah, yeah, oh, no. I'm not I gonna- love you. I, <laughs> I love you. But mostly, Kunanen had settled into an aristocratic persona as a man who wore blazers and ascots. He boasted a degree from Yale and talked endlessly about his interest in imported antiques. Oh. One of the strangest short chapters in this story, though, is Andrew's claim that in 1994, he met and secretly married a young Spanish woman as a part of a green card scheme. Yeah, her name was Hermanita Lito, (laughs) and she was brown-haired. And I just loved it. (laughs) From what Andrew told his friend Henry Brunt, he did a favor by marrying this woman, but somehow fell in love and got her pregnant. I honestly, especially having six from six feet across the room, I don't know <laughs> how it even happened. Must have been Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the other thing, too, is he said that they didn't get an abortion because they were both Catholic. Ah, uh, um, yeah. very nice. Supposedly, Andrew tried giving it a go and got an honest job at a drugstore as a clerk. Mm. But that went south when people started recognizing Lieutenant Commander Cummings mm. or uh. Kurt Damaris or Andrew De Silva <laughs> stocking the fucking shelves at the local drugstore. Yeah. That job only lasted a month. And as soon as the baby was born, supposedly, Kunanen dropped that act and resumed his hunt for the perfect sugar daddy. So is there a baby? No. It's possible. Ah. It's, I, it is possible. There's, I, yeah. there's some rumors that it really was this woman that he ended up hanging out with later. These people he ended up hanging out with later. They all kind of he kind of formulated a story after the fact. I, yeah. I the part of me wonders again. I just don't trust. I really do think in many ways he's sitting at night in a chair silently, like he goes home after playing nine different versions of himself, and he sits and he's in amazement of all of his different plot lines. Yeah. And he sits and he literally goes over him like he's doing dumb shit TV reenactments for Vulture or whatever, where yeah. he's just like sitting and like, oh yeah, and I did that, and I did that. And he's continuing the storylines for himself at night because I don't think that there's anything but his own biography flying through his head at all times. And then just blank. Yeah. yeah. See, I want to know. So if you are Andrew Cananan's bastard child, please write in at <laughs> side stories L- 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 G- L- G- <laughs> Honestly, we're very interested. <laughs> <laughs> now, for a while, that perfect sugar daddy was a millionaire in his late 60s named Norman Blashford. Ooh. It's a very strange name, Blashford. Yeah, never heard of it before. Yeah. He made Kunan and his kept boy on an allowance of $2,500 a month. That's Get awesome. Get that raise. That's He's awesome. moving up. See, as far as Blashford knew, Kunanen was a half Portuguese Jewish, half Filipino who'd spent two years in the Israeli military, but had been pushed out of his family after they discovered he was gay. I wouldn't just push out of the family. They actually pushed me out of a hot air balloon. I love <laughs> it. was a horrible Wednesday. I do love how his characters get more creative every time. This is He's the getting thing. better at it. He yeah. keeps blowing it up because mm-hmm. it's the axiom which every these all of these stupid con artists believe, which is the more ludicrous, the more real it sounds. It does. I, I'm now understanding that no, 
Most people have very sim very simple lives because if they had that incredible life, they'd be on television. But you want to believe it. You know, you, like yes. you want to be you're excited you just met such an interesting person. Sure. It's a, yeah. it's just an anecdote you want to share with somebody else. You know what I mean? And that's what he's kind of keying into yeah. is this idea of like, oh, you're gonna want to tell other people about me. Yeah. But what you want to do is you want to give yourself like quirks, like really like, but you don't necessarily need like interesting quirks. Like you need to know like a lot about like the 1976 lineup of the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, yeah. I it's don't like, like onions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that guy, he doesn't like onions. Yeah. Do you know Ed O'Neill was probably on that team? Really? Yeah, he played for one season as a as a Cleveland Brown. Wow. So you're fu you're fucking fraud, man. I can see it. You're a con man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know that's fake. <laughs> but Blashford wasn't closeted. He and Cunanan went to the symphony together and took frequent trips to Paris, all while Cunanan was supplied with a checkbook-sized wallet filled with credit cards. Cool. That, however, wasn't enough mm. for Cunanan. He was soon seeing another old wealthy man named Lincoln Aston. This was risky because if Norman Blashford discovered the affair, the allowance, trips, and fancy dinners would come to an abrupt halt. My God, these men have fucking old rich men names. They really yeah. do. Lincoln Aston. Norman yeah. Blashford. <laughs> Norman Blashford. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of interesting because he, there's still the need for the thrill. Yeah. You yeah. get the stuff that you want, but then this is the problem with the never ending hole of having either some form of psychopathy or some form of antisocial personality disorder where you can't get it up anymore once it gets too boring. Yeah, like, you can't just relax. He no. probably could still be with Blashford if it was doing it right. It's called, eventually, it's just called a nice relationship. Yeah. Blashford, I don't think, survived the 90s. No. Yeah, well, very old. Was, then he really should have stuck it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because then you get to be, it's you and the Bichon Freeze get to live this incredible <laughs> life together where you didn't do anything. Well, the relationship with Lincoln Aston ended quite abruptly in 1995 when Ashton was found bludgeoned to death with a stone obelisk in his own home. Now, according to author Winsley Clarkson, that murder was pinned on a mentally challenged drifter who confessed at a Colorado police station in 1996. But while you think that Cunanan might have killed Ashton to prevent Blashford from discovering their affair, Ashton was actually at the time trying to make Cunanan go away with a $30,000 bribe. Even more intriguing is that Cunanan would brag to people that he'd been with Lincoln on the night of his death. He said that he had been the one to find the body. So if Cunanan did kill Astor, it would have been more likely that he'd done so because he'd been rejected. I actually push back. I don't think that he killed before he started his spree. That's why I said if. I'm just saying. If, I, if he killed. I don't think he killed Astor either. I'm I, just saying if. Yes, I think that he did see that he got killed. And was like, I don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah, I think that he learned a little lesson in his own little fucked up head of being like, you know, if I have to just get rid of somebody, maybe they'll, somebody will be blaming, they'll blame it on somebody else. Yeah. Well, that was like the first time I saw Murder Fist. You guys were great. You did a good job. And I was like, I could do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> well, as far as Blashford went, that relationship ended during a trip to Europe where Cunanan demanded Blashford buy him a Mercedes SL600 priced at $126,000. He was obsessed with Mercedes. Yeah. yeah. Blashford refused. But since Cunanan had snared two big sugar daddies in a row, he most likely figured he could catch a third just as easily. So he left Blashford as soon as they returned to American soil. Now, while it might seem that Andrew Cunanan only slept with wealthy old men, he did also have relationships and friendships with men his own age. One of those in the friendship realm was a sailor named Jeff Trail, who'd known Cunanan since 1992. This is the one he was going to do for love. Yeah. So this happened during, we know that, he met him while he was in this kind of like long, very uh, whatever you'd call their relationship. Right. And there was like a thing in here where you're like, maybe I too could settle down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like in his head, like, I well, you know I've never been me, but maybe somebody else can see me. Mm -hmm. Do you think that he knew him as Cummings? Because he was also in the Navy? No, he knew him as Andrew Cunanan. Okay. But he always knew him as Andrew Cunanan. Like, it was sort of a casual... I think they, like, casually met each other at a, a gay bar. But Jeff, he was deeply in the closet. He was in the Navy. And this was in the days before even, like, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Yeah, and but the, he was still in the Navy. Yeah. 
<laughs> ah, you can feel the letters. <laughs> and the freedom that Kunanan enjoyed concerning his sexuality made Trail more comfortable with his own sexuality. In other words, being around Andrew was fun, and it made Jeff feel good about himself. Because like Jeff, he was an your all-American boy, you know, quarterback in high school, military man. His main ambition was to be a cop. He wanted to be a chip. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like, and especially in like 1992, like, you know, today that's cool. That's okay. Yeah. But in 1992, like that's impossible for a guy like that to come out as gay. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he, it's interesting because one of the big fantasies that Andrew Cunanan grew up with was the he wanted to kind of wanted to be white. Like he kind of had this fascination about like being blonde haired, blue eyed, like that style. Of he wanted to be the all American boy, all American boy. So I feel like there's like something in that where it's like, maybe this is my way to have my good old fashioned, like, you know, he's a strong man. Yeah. You know, but Jeff also loved guns more than a few times. Jeff would take Andrew out shooting oftentimes with a Taurus 40 caliber that was made specifically to be a concealed carry handgun. With its streamlined, ergonomic design and rugged, compact polymer frame, you'll find the Taurus G2 series strikes the perfect balance between comfort and confidence in any situation. All right, Texas. That wasn't, we didn't even get that. That's not an app. No, that, like, we didn't, that is not that, a roll That was through. straight from the Taurus website. Well, They're still selling the G2 series today. But like, all right, so it's a small gun, but is it a big bullet? Um, I know 40 caliber is big, right? It's big, Am I crazy? Yeah, it's a small gun. I don't, man, it's okay. Gun people go get mad right now and send some yeah. letters. I don't know. But all I know is that I looked at the 40 caliber, the Taurus 40 caliber on the website. Mm -hmm. It looked very small. They said they marketed it as a compact handgun. I don't know. Maybe the G2 is a different kind. <laughs> maybe the G2 <laughs> is a fucking, you know, is I'm not getting in the one. middle of any maybe, of this gun shit. Maybe there's these another one. Maybe, maybe it was a really big fucking gun back then. I don't know. If you want to send us a Taurus 40 caliber, you yeah, can send it right in the yeah, mail. PO send it right in the mail. If you could actually yeah. just leave it in the mailbox with yeah. a, a, a single rose <laughs> tied around it, that'd be great. Now, even though Kunanen constantly tried to push Trail into a sexual relationship, Trail kept it platonic because he had a steady boyfriend when he met Andrew. And even after Trail and the boyfriend broke up, Kunanen had already been thoroughly friend zoned. Even so, when Trail decided to move to Minnesota, Kunanen was as shocked, angered, and heartbroken as if they were lovers. And that rage would come around with full force less than a year later. It, it's really interesting because I think that when these types of guys feel like they finally revealed themselves and they were some form of what they consider to be vulnerable, right? So on some level, he believes, Andrew Kunanen thinks that his real self is so precious and so wonderful that you, if he shows anyone, that's what he's, but I mean, he hates all people, right? He believes he's above everyone yeah. in a way. So he doesn't want to grant you this real personality. So when he does, and then you reject it, he then is kind of set loose yeah. in a way. Now, since Kunanim was between sugar daddies, he started selling downers and bars, but he, by this point, been a pretty steady meth user for years. According to Kunanen's meth dealer, who for some reason went on the record with the author of Volker Favors. He's, he's just love it. <laughs> Kunanen would buy up to $4,000 of meth a month to either use or sell. Well, you know, again, I'm going to put a pound of salt in that too. It's more like if you got drugs, it'd be the way they put it in Volker Favors was kind of interesting where it's like, there's something about being in a, being a guy that will connect to other guys. Yeah, yeah. If you got you know a guy and you don't have to go through all this other stuff. I'll just show you my guy, and, and then you kind of get more societal favors because you're like a guy that makes easy connections, and you know you don't have to go through all this trouble to find a legit dealer of anything. I love giving drugs to my friends. That's you know that was a thing. It's, you know, it's really nice to give drugs to your friends. Hey, I got some extra mushrooms here. Have it's a like, few. It's like oh my god, you you have some. I would love to get that for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, Andrew also started getting a little slimier by this time, trading knowledge and drugs for access and travel. It was rumored that Kunanen would drug men with ketamine and secretly record them having sex while the victim was in a K-hole. And that video would then be used for blackmail. 
Incredibly, though, during all this casual sex, when the AIDS crisis was at its height, Kunanen never contracted HIV, although he somehow convinced himself that he had. And this is sort of the crux of this story. Okay. See, in January of 1997, about four months before his killing spree, Andrew Kunanen very quickly began to unravel. He was suffering from a myriad of minor illnesses that just wouldn't go away, which is sometimes an early sign of an HIV infection. Now, all this is a little muddy, but according to an AIDS counselor named Mike Dudley, Kunanen came into his office just to talk. Dudley had no access to Kunanen's record, so he asked Kunanen if he was HIV positive. But from what it seems like, Kunanen took this as Dudley telling him that he was HIV positive. At the mere question about his infection status, Kunanen subsequently lost his shit, kicking walls and screaming that if he ever found out who did this to him, he was going to get him. Yeah, he was freaking out. And he all, again, there was this whole, he was obsessed with it. And he, there was something about it, because I think it's because it wasn't under his control. Mm-hmm. And he felt that he let somebody in under his control or whatever. So, Isn't that kind of a natural reaction, though? Oh, but, yeah, I'd freak the fuck out. Of yeah, course, yeah, like, oh, yeah. You no, know, no. like, I would lose my mind if someone's like, you got AIDS. I'm like, fucking Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, get it. Jerry. <laughs> Loose lips sink ships, Jerry. <laughs> no, the riskiest thing I ever did was, like, I seriously thought I had HIV when I first moved to college because I was living a risky life. Yeah. Uh, and I was having some of those, You doing like, intravenouses? No, 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 no. Just having a lot of, like, I was a risky life. Not interesting. You're getting pegged? No, you, you can't time? get AIDS from getting pegged. Yeah. It depends on where the peg was. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> but let's just say my lymph nodes were swollen and I was quite, I was quite nervous. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I think we're all very lucky. Yeah. And I, t- I was <laughs> fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I took, and I actually like got my like AIDS, like my HIV test results, like at work. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, Great. Call, call, yeah. Called me up and, but thankfully it was negative. Let me look through. So, uh, is this Mr. Parks? Let me just look through the, the, the papers. You just hear like them. Mm, let me just see if those results. Ah, oh my God. Oh no, sorry. This is Marcus Sharks's paperwork. Let me look at yeah. Oh tomorrow. my fucking God. Oh God. No, this is Marcus Stark's paperwork. And I'm sitting there in the fucking through. offices. I'm in the onion offices on the fucking phone, like with all the other interns. Just fucking tell me. <laughs> you know, if you're positive, they're just going to write an article about it. <laughs> Can I use that? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing is that Dudley finally calmed Andrew down. But after Kunanen left, Dudley got the clear impression that Andrew was HIV positive. Andrew wasn't HIV positive. Autopsy reports later showed that he definitely wasn't HIV positive. But somehow he got it in his head. He convinced himself that he was HIV positive. And I think this was just sort of an excuse. Well, and then everything's running out. Yeah. Right? Everything's, everything's, things, everything's done. Things are starting to fall, truly, quickly fall apart for him. Because, yeah. you know, you remember he also had that couple that he kind of broke up with. There was like, there's a couple, they put that it in the book. That was a whole fucking side quest. There's a whole that side quest that he had a whole family that he was sort of like, he was the godfather of these two kids and he was raising them. That fell apart too. All of these other things just kind of fell apart and fell apart. And it got to the point where it's like, when you're, we're just breaking down to the nothingness that is Andrew. So yeah. do you think he was actually sick all the time, or is he just kind of making it up in his head? He probably Who knows? did have a, I mean, he fucking did meth all the time. Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. probably fucking sick. Yeah, he's probably hung over. And then what do you know, as we get older, is that like it gets less fun. Like yeah. each time we're getting less fun, but it's not the same anymore. It's true. Yeah. But according to Andrew Kunanen's friends, his personality changed as 1997 began. He became angry, bitter, and irresponsible, even more so than usual, because he believed that someone had purposefully infected him with HIV. Using this as an excuse to garner some sympathy, Kunanen traveled to Minnesota to visit his friend Jeff Trail, the one that rebuffed Andrew's advances and had a taste for handguns. Mm. It was here in Minnesota during the dead of winter that Kunanen would coincidentally bump into an old boyfriend from San Diego named David Madsen. And soon, Kunanen, Madsen, and Trail, they were all hanging out. They formed a little, a quick little circle of friends. And also, before he did this, he had like a big goodbye party that he called the last supper that was like he invited all the last like party heads out that he had been with in a long time and they were all sort of like this kind of feels like a funeral like it kind of feels like he's doing something really like fucked up because he was just like you know I'm just 
going to Minnesota. I'm just going to go hang out for a while. You know how it is. You know how it is going to the dead center of Minnesota. I'm really enjoying myself. In the middle of winter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Well, whilst out on the town one night in Minneapolis, though, Kunanen had his third encounter with a celebrity. Mm. This one we know is true. This okay. is real? Yeah, this one's real. Like, this one is absolutely real. It was, like, witnessed by multiple people. For some reason, Lisa Kudrow was out and about at she a got Minneapolis story. club yeah, yeah. at the height of her fame as Phoebe Buffay. This oh, is yeah. 1997 Friends. Yeah. Hey, it oh happens. My God. Honestly, that's where you can party. Yeah. You can party in Minneapolis. You can party in St. Paul. Yeah. You know she loves this. Yeah. Oh, she oh she <laughs> loves this. It was like the guy that faked it, it was the cosplayer named Fluke Skywalker that like you know hung out with Mark Hamill a bunch and then got busted for being a massive pedophile. Mm. And you can see all these pictures of like him and fucking you know like Liam Neeson and all these other people hanging out like. God, they must love this photo album. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Andrew Cunanan also claimed that, like, while he was selling meth, he once ran into, like, David Geffen and started and hung out with David oh, Geffen. Oh, sure. You know, the guy yeah, who yeah. fucking yeah. founded Asylum Records. Definitely and Geffen him. Records and all it's that. definitely yeah. him. He actually came straight out. He was like, I did not hang out with that guy. Yeah. He got to. Yeah. He well, probably did. <laughs> <laughs> Cunanan, of course, cornered Kudrow and clung to her desperately. I would have done the same thing. <laughs> I love so you. Did you write, did you write Smelly Cow? Or was that from the writers? <laughs> did you make that up? Is your real name Phoebe? <laughs> but it ruined Kudrow's night. You would have been a great companion. How are you Kudrow. doing? <laughs> How you doing? You remember from the show? How you doing? Is Lisa that, Kudrow, right? Is that monkey real? <laughs> is that monkey real? Is that a real monkey? Is it Kudrow? <laughs> or Kudrow? <laughs> Mom, but that's the thing is that, you know, as you do when you get the dud at a party, Kudrow kept looking around while Kunanen went on and on, uh, just desperately hoping that someone would come rescue her. No one would. Well, he would write all the, you know, he would be talking about neoclassical antiques and talking about all his fucking garbage and opera. And like, he was just always doing all that shit. Yeah. Whose story is this? <laughs> Like the, she's not telling people. Yeah. Well, it was a guy. It was a writer who was there, oh, like okay. so, who saw the whole thing. Because they said that, like, she would try to like sort of talk to somebody else or like get away, and Kunana would like tap on her shoulder, like, "Hey, we're not done with our conversation yet. Like, oh, you need, my, to, ke you need yeah. to keep talking to me." Uh, Just but, radiating bad vibes. Yeah, and the more Kudra tried getting away, the more irritated and persistent Kunana became. Finally, after dealing with him for like an hour. Kudrow told him that she was going to the bathroom, old trick, and just fucking went home. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, old Kudrow, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> According to people who were there, though, after Kunanen realized he'd been snubbed by Lisa Kudrow, his face was full of rage. I fucking I hate friends. And I, Seinfeld was better. <laughs> Seinfeld was better. Phoebe! <laughs> Phoebe, stop me! And one person described the look on his face as thunderous. Wow. In other words, Kunanen's fury was beginning to boil over. He would soon after return to San Diego for a few months, but he wasn't done with Minneapolis just yet. He returned in April of that year, and by the time he left, David Madsen and Jeff Trail were both dead at Kunanen's hands. And that will be where we pick back up for part two. This is a long ass story, man. Like, you know, we just got into it. We are just kind of setting up who this guy is. Next week, we're going to watch these dominoes fall all the way down to South Beach. It's kind of crazy just how it was a massive across the country crime spree that this guy did. He um, legitimately very frightening. I find Andrew Cunanan very frightening. Yeah. I think it's because of you meet so many of these types in our industry. And like a lot of them end up being kind of fine. You know, most of them are fine. Hangers on that kind of like develop into other stuff. But like there's just something about that, you know, because it's the fan, the Wesley Snipes, Robert De Niro. Movie. We just got uh, he's just decided he just decided to become a human tornado. And there's really not much you can do about that. And that's the thing about, you know, like these days, I guess it's a lot harder to do. But, you know, especially back then, like America is so fucking big. The reason why people get caught when they murder someone is because they stay in one place. Yeah. It's like, hard, to, hard to leave, especially yeah. if you're broke. Yeah. But if you're someone like Andrew Cunanan, who's extremely resourceful, like you murder someone. 
you can leave and you could be three states away in a day. Two different people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you you're could, somebody yeah. else now. You're yeah. Lieutenant Cummings. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can know? be somebody else and you can just keep going and keep going until you decide it's over. Now, I know that it's bad to kill people. Thank you. But I Thank you. do Thank miss you. a time when you could get away with crimes. Sure. <laughs> and like, I hey, feel like that's over. You, you know, know what? Yeah, I it's will really say, hard to get away with crimes these days. The yeah. only thing that's true is that the bus is still the last truly anonymous way to travel. Oh, my God, dude. It really is. I remember one time I was riding fucking Greyhounds and it was just like, is this one going north? And you just throw your bag in there. Oh, yeah. You, you, could, get in. you could still go buy it with cash. You might still not. You Now you might need to put your name on a ticket. I don't remember. I don't. It's been a while since I got on a bus. It's been but, a while. Too. Yeah. But I do. Rem I do. Do know that when I was taking a lot of greyhounds between like Rochester and Texarkana when I was doing like journeyman construction, yeah, uh, like I definitely met the most criminals I've ever met in my life. Oh my god! Yeah, and oh, those yeah. bolt buses. I mean, you just need a fake email address. You can get on anything. Oh yeah, I mean, this was truly. I mean, this was like 1999. So that was those are the days when you truly did just hop on and that bus from Texarkana to Abilene. Uh, that was. Um, the first stop was the prison in Texarkana. Yay! So that was fun. Yeah, so every time you go to Abilene, there's going to be a guy that's taking that bus from Texarkana yeah, to getting Dallas. Out. Yeah, Yeah, and he might sit right next to you, and oh. he might ask you to help him steal a car in Dallas. Oh hey, <laughs> hey, man, again, it's called making friends. you got to open your heart to people. Yeah. You never know who you're going to be on that open road. Yeah. Do you remember when Rikers would just, like, unload buses of people at the Port Authority? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That shit was that. crazy. It yeah. was hey, man, here's fingers crossed they do it again. <laughs> Guys, you don't want to check us out. Go to veeps.com slash LPOTL. We want you to know if you can't make it to the LPN Beach Blanket Bingo, you can watch from your fucking house October 20th. You could watch you. So go to veeps.com slash LPOTL and you'll be able to buy those at home streaming tickets. It's going to be a fun fucking show. We're encouraging people to wear costumes mm -hmm. because it's Halloween it's time. It's Halloween time. Please wear costumes. And we're going to do a big thing there. Um, also, uh, we got uh, uh, Atlanta. I'm going to be there October 11th, next Tuesday. See me there. It's at the ATL Donner .com. I'm going to be hosting a dinner party where it's cannibal themed. We're not eating human meat legally. I have to say that. It is going to just <laughs> look like human meat. Um, but come out to a matzah in Atlanta. It's going to be really fun. Nice. And uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I know I'm going to be yelling at people while they eat. Cool. Hell yeah. And that's what I best at. Nice. I'm going to be doing the I'm doing the New York Comedy Festival. I'm oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, I'm opening nice. for Take a Banana for the Ride, Jeff's one-man show. So come check that out. I can't uh, wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, that's awesome. You're going this weekend? No, uh, the first weekend of November I'll oh. be there. The first weekend, of, it's going to be um, unbelievable. We just did it in Boston at the Wilbur Theater. It's honestly the best show we've ever done together. Yeah, it sounds great. great. I, honestly, yeah. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. All right. Hail, sweet Satan. Hail, you guys. Hail, you. Hail. Be good to yourself. Be good to yourself. And be good to me. This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors, you can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com. Yeah.